Welcome everyone to the Howling Coyote. And I'm privileged today to have Torben Simonson from Copenhagen joining me. And I invited him after having read his scoping review of healing architecture. And uh, that interested me for two reasons. One, I teach a class in uh, arts and medical humanities at the University of Maine. And one of our weeks, we always have someone, we always have an architect come in to talk about he creating healing spaces. And the second reason is we, I also work for Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, which serves the five tribes of Maine. And we've just, we're just in the process of opening a recovery center. And there's been a lot of attention paid to um, how space facilitates recovery. And so with that having been said, I, I want to invite Torben to introduce himself and tell, tell us a little bit about himself and his work. And, and then we'll have a conversation. Thank you very much, Louis, and thank you once again for, for having me on the podcast. Um, I'm very happy to engage in a conversation with you about the topics that you just raised and kind of bringing some of the work that I've done uh, to bear on those topics. Um, so as you mentioned, my name is Torben Simonsen. Uh, I am located in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, currently, I'm an assistant professor at the IT University in Copenhagen and affiliated with um, a research group called Technologies in Practice, as well as the Center for Digital Welfare. So this current position has slightly moved me away from some of the work that I think we'll be discussing today, um, which I did as a um, research fellow and PhD student at Copenhagen Business School, um, where I did the work on uh, healing architecture and more broadly speaking on the uh, spatial organization of psychiatric practice in particular. And um, I'm of course very happy that you found the paper uh, or the scoping review um, of interest in relation to thinking about healing architecture. And maybe I could sort of start with telling you, I guess the story of how that paper came about. And I guess that will bring us to some of the questions related to um, how space may or may facilitate recovery. Um, and I'm very curious to hear about your work on kind of arts and medical humanities as well, and how you have engaged with architects in relation to that. So hopefully we can discuss those topics as well. Um, so the paper actually, the, the paper um, Healing Archi Architecture and Healthcare um, came about because sort of as an, a necessity or an afterthought on some of my previous work because of the nature of the concept of healing architecture, which was really growing traction, especially in the Nordic context in architectural practice. And of course, these architectural practices were brought to bear on specific um, medical spaces and psychiatric spaces in particular. But when you addressed um, psychiatric professionals or medical professionals, um, they didn't really know what the concept meant, where it came from, what the history of it was. And so my colleagues and I were interested in simply investigating the research literature, figuring out who is actually considered um, the impact and implications of healing architecture in specific clinical practices. So there's been done some work on sort of conceptual development but less work on actually trying to study what it does in practice. And that's what I try to do in my um, research on healing architecture and practice. So th that was sort of trying to figure out what kind of conversations are going on and um, what do we actually know about the impact for uh, clinical outcomes that uh, architecture may have. Um, and surprisingly, there hadn't been done much work on studying how healing architectures actually have an impact on health outcomes and um, experiences of uh, healing and recovery. At least we didn't find any based on the, the sort of search criteria that we um, deployed for the scoping review. So we only, we narrowed it down to 
seven specific studies, which isn't a lot, which is sort of at the bare minimum of, of what a scoping review can can sort of um, contain. Um, but nonetheless, um, we 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 found that specific design principles um, have been sort of identified, or specific architectural properties have been identified to have specific um impact on on recovery outcomes and um we highlight these in the paper and they are um, that a view to nature is important so uh, green spaces are important um the specific ambiance of the space makes a difference wayfinding patients control over the um, immediate environment makes a difference access to single rooms and sunlight but the claim or the sort of proposition that we also try to make in the as a as a conclusion to the scoping review is while these architectural properties may indeed be very important, in order for us to better comprehend the impact of healing architecture, we should also be studying practices within which these architectures um, are a part. So actually going out to spaces considered to be um, healing architecture and following um, both professional staff, but also um, patients who are, for instance, hospitalized in these spaces to see what is it that's actually going on. Can we, can we identify the impact of, of architecture on these um, practices? So yeah, that kind of, I guess, situates the paper a bit um, and also the, the sort of claim it tries to make about the importance of studying practices rather than only looking at uh, identifying causal relations between architectural properties and health outcomes. Right, and and I I also read your paper on from sociology of health and illness uh, with Cameron Duff, and mm -hmm. I thought it was fascinating how you followed people around in the psychiatric unit and and explored their the interaction of the psychiatric um, process with the physical space and and it made me think of the there's a i'm a psychiatrist I'm, i probably should have mentioned that um among other things that i am and um I work occasional weekends in the psychiatric hospital here in our town, Bangor, Maine, um, usually with the children, usually on the children and adolescent units, though sometimes with the adults. And it was very interesting to me because we have a long hallway and, and um, something similar happens when a when a child is put in restraints, they call it's called a code gray. Uh, I don't know why they picked the color gray, but um, when they when they have to contain a child uh, or even restrain a child, um, they do something very similar to what you described in in the paper on healing architecture and psychiatrics practice. They shuffle all of the children into their rooms and the rooms become as you mentioned um, cells in a sort in a kind of way they, they become a a restrictive space and um and then the staff surrounds the child and 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 all movement is stopped and uh it 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 just you know, reading your paper made me think of that so strongly. And, and I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that sort of aspect of, of what you found um, in the psychiatric hospital in Denmark. Yeah, so first off, the story that you're telling really resonates, I think, with the sort of story that um, we're trying to tell in that paper, which is things take place within a specific setting. What is interesting about this particular setting is that it is labeled as being healing architecture. So there's a specific intent uh, 
uh, built into the psychiatric space. So the spatial disposition looks in a, in a particular way designed by architects uh, to, uh, to have specific affordances that support both treatment practices, but al also the organization of the psychiatric process, if you will. And what we try to try to follow is an instance in which um, the uh, nursing staff uh, manage uh, a patient that they consider to be disorderly. And so the, the interaction that we trail within the in, uh, inpatient setting is the staff trying to manage simultaneously the patient in question, um, helping him uh, during his difficult situation, but simultaneously also the, the broader spaces of the inpatient setting. So as you mentioned um, in your story, the children are sort of shuffled together and, and, and I guess put back into their individual rooms. And the same happens in this case. And for good reasons, um, if you ask nursing staff, because it's to protect uh, the other patients, but also to protect the patient in question for different reasons. But the consequence of this work is indeed that the sort of single rooms who are uh, who have been designed to be sort of a solitary, but also a protective space because patients have some extent of um, control over what the space looks like. They have um, personal affects and things like that, but it becomes a restrictive space in that situation because they're shuffled away and the doors are closed. Um, so here the space becomes mutually constituted by the practices uh, taking place in that setting. So this speaks to sort of the argument about healing architecture having specific design properties that those can't be mapped directly onto specific uh, recovery um, trajectories because they become folded into specific practices um, in everyday life in an inpatient setting. And that's what we sort of trace through the instance of this one patient moving around the space, which is a very open, architecturally open space designed to indeed allow patients to interact both with each other and with staff. But in this instance becomes an issue and a problem because suddenly all the staff members within the inpatient setting have to be mobilized in order to manage uh, what it is that's going on. And um, of course, the situation that we describe in that paper ends with um, the, the patient receiving um, medication. So even though there are these logics of recovery, which are increasingly also folded into hospital spaces, um, medical practices are remain very important, of course. Right, and it, and it gave me the sense that that you you wrote about the tension among the 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 healing function and the coercive function, and it it struck me that at best it's an ambivalent healing architecture in the psychiatric hospital because indeed yeah i mean you because you can't escape the element of coercion that exists there and the no that, yeah and what no i was i thought we could we could maybe talk a bit about the role that the architects play um mm -hmm. because what i found to be really interesting is that so of course you know this that in the history of psychiatry space and architectural form have have played a role for a long time um, from the great asylums that were typically placed outside of cities in green spaces because the idea was that nature had a restorative effect to today's more modern buildings where um, green spaces and nature are sort of folded into the buildings that are then placed within um, or at least closer to uh, somatic hospital facilities or that's at least the case in the nordic countries uh, because ideas of recovery and deinstitutionalization have informed the way that um, contemporary buildings are, are developed. So whereas during asylum construction, um, medical professionals and doctors had a strong say in the spatial disposition of the asylums, the architects that I talked to in this particular project had a great deal of freedom in defining what healing architecture looked like and especially what healing architecture and recovery in combination 
look like in spatial form. So when I talked to the architects, they really drew on a different set of both logics, but also experiences in developing what sort of the future of, of architectural um, building look like. That's how they put it, at least. Um, and so rather than looking to other psychiatric facilities, they sort of tell the narrative of, oh, we didn't uh, know where to look. Uh, the US didn't have what we, were, what we were looking for. We couldn't find inspiration in Germany and the Netherlands and other places that you might look to. So we had to figure something new out ourselves. Um, so they took a sort of freedom in developing the spatial form of a particular trajectory of recovery. So they sort of read up on what recovery meant and they tried to translate that into the built form. And I found that very interesting because the way that the sort of broader hospital is uh, designed is to support a very specific uh, road to recovery, if you will. But the assumptions that are built into the architecture then assume that that road is sort of a direct progression. <laughs> so patients begin in the more protective confines of a personal space that open up to more uh, shared spaces where they can interact with other patients and staff onto even more um, sort of public spaces uh, where even the uh, real public outside of the hospital can, can move through the hospital space. So they gain more. Um, so the idea is that they, they um, practice the ability to return to society is sort of the way that they speak about it. But in practice, of course, there's all different kinds of relapses and issues that arise. So that idea of progression doesn't hold in practice, which means also that the design of the hospital doesn't support the initial idea of move, a road to recovery moving through spatial form. And I think the story that we talked about before also test, is a testament to that, that all, all sorts of ordering work takes place within those designed spaces. Um, yes, so it's interesting to me that, that architects are given sort of the power to define in built form what um, recovery in a psychiatric setting might look like. Uh, and I was curious to, to ask you, Lewis, about your sort of experiences with interacting with architects and in thinking about sort of creating healing spaces. Well, <clears throat> Or does this resonate what I'm saying? Yes, yes, it does. And in fact, uh, I've, I've actually found it rather difficult to find architects who will speak to me. And huh. um, I, did, I did have an experience uh, when I was working for uh, the, local, uh, the local, one of the local hospitals. And um, I, was, I was working in a clinic that used to be a grocery store. And there were, there were very few windows, as you can imagine. And there was a, a central area where the, the nurses hung out. And then there was a, a windowless room where the supervising physicians sat, of which I was one. And then there were three long hallways. And, and then there was a, a common space with um, lots of desks and dividers for the, the physicians in training and the medical students to sit. Uh, but, but the dividers were, you know, they, they were thin. They were, and they were, mm, I don't know, maybe a meter and a half tall. So, so they weren't, they were symbolic dividers. They weren't, they didn't create rooms. And so I, I was asked to take these architects on a tour of this space. And basically they just muttered to each other how, how dismal this space was and how um, terrible it was. And, and when we were done, I said, well, what would you guys do? And they said, gut it. <laughs> you know? And I said, okay, well, <laughs> wow. then, yeah, I, and I said, well, then what would you build? And they said, instead of three hallways, we'd have three circular pods. And, uh, you know, with, with 
people in the center and exam rooms around the periphery. I mean, with the nurses and doctors in the center and exam rooms around the periphery. And, and maybe people would enter through the back of the room and the doctor would enter from his or her front of the room. And, and maybe there would be a, a more interesting common space, you know, because um, the waiting room was, was relatively abysmal and, you know, sort of a unfriendly warehouse type room facing a, a bank of desks with, you know, glass separating the entering patient from the from the people at the what what's called the front office. And and it was interesting to, to talk to them because I where I work now we have um we don't have a front office in that sense. We have uh, a woman who sits at a desk in the middle of an open room and uh, not separated by glass from anyone. And people come into this open space um, that that's inviting, lots of, of cultural artifacts because it serves the 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 five tribes of Maine, the indigenous people of Maine, and uh, couches and, you know, coffee and tea and water and chocolate, always chocolate. And um, people sit in this open space and talk with each other, which would never happen in the other space. And the other space... Um, minimized interaction through its architectural properties. I, I, don't, I don't know enough to even talk about how it did that, but it, that happened. Whereas the space I'm in now um, facilitates interaction. And, and it's warm and friendly, and there's a dog on Thursdays. And, um, you know, pe people, so the the practitioner's rooms open off this common central room. But when they come out or when someone leaves their office where they see the people, um, everyone says hi, hello to each other. You know, and, it, and um, it's so different. And, and I, I wonder, does that give you any thoughts about healing architecture for clinic spaces or the I mean I again yeah yeah no I again again I think the story that you tell resonates with my experience of especially I would say the intent behind the spatial disposition of the hospital space that I um, researched in in Denmark because it was indeed designed as a more open flexible space and the idea of transparency really permeates the entire building all the way down to the inpatient settings. So there's a lot of glass, which is inspired from modern office buildings rather than previous um, psychiatric facilities. And the reason for the use of transparency is twofold. There's a symbolic sort of rationale that is nothing going on within this space is something that we need to hide away, which is sort of a... I guess, a narrative from the history of psychiatry that they try to um, go against. So kind of showing that uh, psychiatric practice is um, a sound practice um, and it can be visible even to the public almost. So the public doesn't, has, doesn't have access of course to the inpatient settings, but it's sort of a narrative that, that they can tell. And on more practical terms, um, the transparency is also support, supposed to afford a sense of safety and security for both patients and staff. So the way that the inpatient settings that I looked at are organized is that at the um, beginning of the setting, when you walk in, the nursing station is placed and it, and it sort of figures almost as a glass cube. So it's, it's all glass except for the doors that you can enter. And then 
um, juxtaposed to the sort of professional space of the nursing station is sort of a common area, an open space where um, patients can interact with each other. And typically around 17 patients are hospitalized within one inpatient setting in this hospital. And then at the center of the inpatient setting is a sort of green space that opens uh, up to, to the sky. So the, the idea is to bring nature in. So it has a lot of greenery and, um, and small plants. Um, yes, exactly. That's, that's the space. Yeah. So the, the glass cube is the nursing station that you can see there. And the adjacent space is the sort of open common area. And it's sort of warm and welcoming and the, the colorations uh, are nice. At the far end of the inpatient setting is are two sort of common rooms designed to have, I guess, informal conversations and encounters between patients. Um, it has a sofa and um, a table tennis, but in practice that space was never used, not during my time within the setting at least. Um, for different reasons. So here issues of sort of the social construction of risk comes into play because staff are sort of afraid to be alone in that area because while they may still be visible, there's sort of a, a long stretch to get help if something happens at the far end. And patients don't really like to be there because they also become sort of invisible to the um, staff whom they really want to engage with. So what happened is that the common areas at the far end were moved all the way up right next to the nursing station, which created a sort of interesting dynamic between um, sort of a staging practice. So patients would almost sit and, and watch uh, staff conducting you know, administrative tasks. And because I was afforded the opportunity to sort of switch stages so I could walk freely between the nursing station and uh, where patients were. Uh, and I got to know everybody within the settings. I sort of learned that staff found it very hard to sort of perform a professional persona. So almost hiding in plain sight was a way of protecting themselves from constant inquiries from patients. So that was actually a lot of hard work for them that was produced due to the architectural disposition, right? So the glass sort of forced them to perform a specific um, professional persona. And I, I sort of drew on earlier work from the symbolic interactions or at Goffman to talk about staging practices. So there is a front stage and a backstage, but these tended to switch <laughs> uh, depending on which perspective you took. So the same was uh, occasioned by patients so sort of performing their own patienthood in order to engage staff as well. Um, so rather than the sort of panoptic mechanisms described by Michel Foucault in his early work, everybody is visible to everybody in this setting. And that creates a totally new set of dynamics, which again, create new, new sorts of uh, both interactions and relations between staff, but also between staff and patients. Um, in a different paper, I try to make the argument that the sort of flexibility and transparency of this modern architecture actually produces more work for um, the nursing staff in particular in managing not only their administrative tasks, uh, their medical related tasks, but also in having to manage the space. So the flexible space might afford um, sort of openness and flexibility to interact, but it also requires everybody to, to understand um, how to engage and um, sort of be situated within that space. And because it's very open, I had some patients say to me, oh, I wish there was just a space for me to do this and a space for me to do that and a space for eating because there's so much going on. I don't also have to figure out what I have to do in this particular space. So the relations between form and function were very fluid, uh, which made staff sort of take control of the space and try to sort of determine what can take place where. So, you know, patients would often feel out of place as it were, because they were constantly correct. Oh, you can't talk about this here. And uh, 
this type of conversation is supposed to take place in either your own room or in this medical space, which is outside of the inpatient setting. So a lot of work in simply figuring out what was supposed to go on uh, took up a lot of effort. I can imagine it. It's almost as if the the nurses are in a cage. Yes. And I I think I would have felt much more comfortable if if it wasn't glass all to the ceiling. I mean, I, I think somehow the way it's sealed off completely makes it. It doesn't get rid of the hierarchical nature of the relationship in the way that I think the architects thought it would. Like it yes. doesn't accomplish that purpose. You're completely right. Yeah. And it, it, it was actually an explicit design principle to break barriers and hierarchies between patients and staff. But this instead sort of sediments those hierarchies also because um, a lot of staff sort of felt called to intervene in patient behavior more so than they would in other specific spaces. Um, and interestingly in the photo that is currently showing the door is closed and regulations ascribe that it's supposed to be closed, but in practice, the door was always open. Huh. So while, while there was a sort of segregation between staff and patients, sound would travel easily. So there was also a different sort of affective labor taking place because they would try to listen in and they would hear or sort of patients would pick up on snippets of conversation and that would produce sort of um, anxiety is too strong a word, but uh, they would be confused. Are they talking about me? Uh, oh no, is this um, problem related to my issue? So it would sort of create um, uncertainties is the word I'm looking for. Um, and then staff would again have to manage those uncertainties. So in a way that the transparency rather than produce sort of legibility, it produces uncertainty. And that's, and that's a very so, sort of um, tangible consequence of the architectural form. Um, and so with all these sort of insights that um, you can gain from studying these interactions in practice, there are indeed sort of tensions with the ideas that architects are sort of developing in relation to what healing architectures are and what they're supposed to be. Interestingly, this building has sort of become a standard uh, that other developers come to to look for in developing new hospitals. So even though that medical professionals sort of point out all the issues that they're experiencing in practice, they're winning design awards and um, it's becoming sort of, yeah, a standard within architectural practice. And Carlson architects who drew this are currently uh, developing, I think, two other hospitals in Denmark and one in Sweden as well, our neighboring country. Oh, you've muted it, Louis, so I can't hear you. Sorry. I was saying it's so typical of the siloed nature of the world in which the architects don't talk to the nurses and the physicians and vice versa. And the architects are completely proud of creating something that's perhaps even somewhat dysfunctional. I mean, it creates problems as well as perhaps solves a few, but certainly creates new problems. And uh, it's odd, isn't it, that people don't sit down and talk with each other, but I find that in every field. No, I agree. And what's sort of odd with this particular project is that despite attempts to in indeed bridge sort of professional practices from architects to medical professionals, there still seems to be sort of a, because architects build worlds and they're convinced that <laughs> their world, world building uh, abilities um, can be plugged into different domains. Uh, and I think here that they, I, I mean, it was, I've had conversations with the architect who designed this hospital afterwards, and he consistently maintains that 
medical professionals are simply using the building wrong. <laughs> so he sort of casts the inhabitants of the space as users and those users simply need to learn how to utilize the space. But what my argument would be that it's not a it's not sort of a, a clear distinction between sort of a Euclidean space that's just empty and then you put people into it, but they're mutually constituted. So there might be learning to be had, but it goes both ways. And in that sense, the architecture is not um, sort of determinative of what takes place within those spaces. Um, those are constantly uh, in a dynamic relation with, with uh, the inhabitants. Right, and and it's interesting, isn't it, in that um, it's sort of a, a hierarchical way of deciding things that that the architects say, well, we know what healing architecture is, and and we're just going to do this, and you're just not using it correctly. <laughs> you're just not right. <laughs> you're just not one with the program. <laughs> and I, I which think is a pretty uh, harsh provocation, I would say, uh, to make that sort of statement. Just assuming that it's because people don't understand how to use their fantastic designs, um, they wouldn't, of course, they would claim otherwise. But um, I think they can take a little pushback. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, and it it happens in every field where. You know, the experts don't ask the people, you know, they don't ask the people who are the participants. You know, it's that idea of um, community-based participatory action research, you know, in which you, you actually go into a community and find out what people think. And as a, as a kind of interesting aside, I know of one university that use that approach for um, designing their sidewalks. So it was, it's the University of Northern British Columbia in Canada, and it was built anew. I mean, it, it, was to, it appeared from nowhere in, I think, 1990 or something like that. And so they said, well, um, why don't we just not make sidewalks for a year and see where people walk. And then once they've worn it, worn the grass huh. away, we'll put sidewalks there. And I thought, wow. Yeah, that's an interesting approach. Yeah, it is, isn't it? I mean, it's both simple and brilliant. You know, yes. To just know that you actually probably can't it... I can guess it. Right. And it's indeed simple, but not banal, right? Because it has far reaching implications. Um, but just one, I guess, uh, extra thing in relation to the, the development of the hospital was that it's actually also won prizes for its um, engagement with potential users. But I think a critical reading of that would be to say they had one specific figure of the patient in mind and the patients hospitalized at the institution were uh, of a, I mean, they had very different needs. So in that sense, having one idea of the user is problematic, but I guess that's an, an old discussion in, in design. Um, and also those uh, both medical professionals and patient organizations who were involved only had a say on minor details of the design. So the spatial disposition was predetermined by the architects. And then uh, people could sort of comment on what kind of door handle they would need or the type of uh, bed that should be within the single rooms or that uh, clothing rack should be made of rubber for protective reasons. So sort of minor details and overall idea of what this this hospital space should look like, um, and I and get room for improvement there. Yeah, it makes me think about this recovery center that we're opening shortly, and um, it's mostly open. There's two stories, 
and it, I wish I had some pictures I could show you, but I, I, I don't have mm. any. I should I should have taken some the last time I was there, but it, the downstairs is is largely open, with a with a industrial kitchen, um, and a fairly large kitchen, and then there's some there's a a, a glassed in room. And then a not glassed in room for for you know family meetings. And then there's an open space upstairs with with sort of ringed by offices around it. And it'll be interesting to see how people take to the space because we haven't opened yet. And um, I I mean it feels comfortable, I mean, to walk through. <clears throat> and and um, none of the, we won't have any involuntary people. I mean, some people are mandated to treatment in the sense that if they don't go for treatment, they go to jail. Um, so, but it's their choice to go to treatment. I mean, you. One could argue that that's not a real choice, but um, at any rate, they're not there against their will, and there's no coercion of medication or anything like that. But um, but it will be interesting to see how people interact with the space, and uh, it it's it's certainly newer and more pristine, but also friendly or friendly not friendlier than our space in Bangor that I was telling you about um, just because it's brand new though the building is an old it's it's a an old restaurant that was sort of gutted and and um, huh. redesigned repurposed repurposed yeah yeah, yeah. No, honestly, it's really they they kept the kitchen <laughs> the Though I think they created <laughs> all the all the stoves because they're so shiny and brand new looking. Yeah. But um, yeah, and and you know there's birch tree birch trees painted on the walls and that that's sort of I guess what you found in the scoping review that attempt to bring nature indoors. Um, you know, to... I've actually started to think a little bit about uh, biophilic design. I don't know if you've come across that concept. Um, I only heard of it recently, which is indeed to sort of design with um, nature in mind or indeed bringing nature inside um, architectural practice. And one, I guess, critical proposition could be to say, well, is it really nature that we're bringing in or sort of a sanitized version that we can appropriate into certain practices because nature is wild and is there indeed space for the wild uh, in in an institutional setting like a psychiatric hospital um, i don't have the answer to that but i think it's an interesting sort of tension between specific notions about what nature is and can do and how it's then brought into in a particular way in architectural development. Um, and I see that specifically in sort of, in relation to psychiatric practices because nature has played a, an important role in, in terms of restorative um, spaces and the reasons for asylums being situated uh, outside of cities, what it was indeed to have access to nature, but is it a similar notion of nature? Uh, I I'm unsure. <laughs> it, it is it is a good question whether it's whether to what extent is it can one accomplish that? And, right. And you know, pictures of birch trees are not the same as birch trees. <laughs> so, Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. 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 Well, and I and I think of of um, the the whole question of art of art in institutions arises, and in the hospital that I was 
describing earlier. So the notion of art is putting a painting of a dog on the wall, you know, <laughs> or a <clown>. Yeah, <laughs> right. Close to the cafeteria. Yeah. And it doesn't go much further than that. And, um, no, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting what kind of notions of aesthetics uh, come into play because again, the hospital I looked at had a, a very um, explicit notion of, of coloration, both in relation to wayfinding, of course, but also in terms of uh, sort of animating specific affective, affective states. And they worked a lot with lighting design to follow uh, circadian rhythm. But in practice, what happened, it had all these different types of technical glitches. So rather than having the warm sun in the morning, suddenly it would turn into this very blue institutionalized color. And it sort of became the laughing stock, both among uh, staff and patients. Oh, now the light is healing me. Can you see? And so that was sort of interesting because there was put so much effort and money and conceptualization into developing something that sort of became an ongoing joke in practice. And similarly with the colorations that, oh, this green is supposed to be very good for me, but I don't like green. And so suddenly it became um, sort of a, a non entity in relation to thinking about healing and architecture be because this specific subject didn't you know, re respond to that color, even though it was you know, loaded with philosophical intent. Um, so it's interesting how we think about art and specific practices and how how, I mean, my experience is that, that art development is um, only partially bounded to the practices within which they're thought to uh, operate. Yeah, and um, it's interesting, my, my wife, who's a, a social worker with, with our, with Wabanaki also, um, is, is working trying to do community-based participatory art in one of the recovery houses. And mm -hmm. um, it's amazing how slow it goes of engaging people and, and even getting them to decide what color of paint should be on the wall it takes forever. And I can imagine that that would just annoy architects to the maximum. That, that they would just see it as such a waste of time. <laughs> you know? But actually, they, they also uh, hire in expertise. So the question of who becomes an expert in this space is also sort of an open question. So they hired a, a Danish, um, lands is it a landscape architect? I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure what her profession was, but she developed the entire color scheme for the, for the hospital and actually won a prize for that color scheme as well. Um, so again, sort of specific ex professions become enrolled in the development of, of one notion of what healing architecture is. And a, and a Danish poet actually wrote uh, poetry on the transparent walls, sort of as a, a small film, film. So you could read poetry everywhere, which also sort of became a laughing stock because nobody understood what it meant. So it was supposed <laughs> to animate conversation and development, but it was like, I don't understand what this is. Um, and it created confusion instead. So again, there's sort of tension between intent and sort of uh, lived experience. Yeah, that, and that's, that's such a, a fascinating theme, you know, because lived experience is often so different than one's projected idea of it, you know. And it, it reminds me of the, the famous baseball player, Yogi Berra. He said, in theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice, they're often different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it's um, amazing. I mean, my wife is just um, having to learn more patience than she thought she would ever have to learn. And, you know, she's sort of a go get things done person. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I, the first, the first, the first, um, you know, the first thing she did was to 
take junk out of the the community room, <laughs> like to remove trash. <laughs> yeah, and put out food, and it so it's a slow process, but but we'll see how it goes. This idea of trash actually reminds me of um, sort of a proposition I've tried to make make by drawing on the social anthropologist uh, Mary Douglas's work, who has this idea of matter out of place. And what was interesting is that the, the hospitalized patients would leave stuff everywhere from cutlery to clothes to um, personal items and staff would use immense amounts of time and resources on cleaning up basically. Um, and the point was that that to them, to the, to the nursing staff, that was matter out of place. So they were, they considered that disorder in an orderly, otherwise orderly space, but that, that was not the case for the hospitalized patients because they were sort of invited to appropriate the open and flexible spaces, which they did <laughs> leaving stuff around. But then they were of course told, no, no, this is, you can't have that here that belongs in your room. So again, there's sort of a hierarchy put into place um, that was almost, um, how do you say, strengthened or induced by the openness of the spatial design. So because there weren't you know, clear partition, partitions, um, staff would sort of enact a social architecture to create those partitions. Um, so the, again, the, the sort of trash or disorderly stuff became matter out of place, but only in the eyes of the powerful, which in this instance were the nursing staff, of course. We, um, we, it just reminded me of that, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that then reinforces the hierarchical nature of the relationship, which indeed. the architects were trying to, to minimize. <laughs> yes, indeed. So that's sort of paradoxical, yeah. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's, it's a really important lesson that must be repeated constantly that, that um, when you don't consult those whom you're building for, you might build incorrectly. You might not Indeed. get it right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there's sort of a constant attempt at trying to get it right, but even even though if you, I guess you'll never succeed because the ways that things are picked up in practice hinge on particular circumstances, right? Um, and I guess that's what I'm also trying to sort of subtly argue that because architects have asked me, so how should we design the space? And all I can say to them, well, I, I don't know where you should put your walls or your partitions, but I, what I can show you is that without partitions at all or with transparent, full transparency, these sort of practices uh, are afforded and um, they sort of grow out. Uh, and we need to um, think of that going forward. So I can't tell you the square footage of a room or the height of the ceiling or the colorations, what are the appropriate sort of architectural properties to induce recovery because it hinges on sort of a multiplicity of other factors, including the types of patients that are there, the uh, treatment logics that are enrolled and negotiated, all sorts of things um, are at play. Well, and I, and I think the most, the take home point that I got is that space is not separate from um, use that that I think you said that that pra practice imposes itself on the space and the space imposes itself on practice. And Indeed, they're, they're mutually constituted, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they sort of form each other as you go and and the results can be different from what everyone expected, which is- yes. But, th but those sort of complexes of actions, of course, don't disappear. Um, in sort of organizational studies, you would say that routines need to be constantly uh, 
um, reenacted to hold. And I think the same goes for the relations between space and use or space and practice that one doesn't determine the other. Um, but that's not to say that sort of um, there's nothing to build on, <laughs> uh, but it's ongoing. Right, right. And, and I thought there was a paper that I used in one of my classes. Let me just look at, I thought it might interest you. Um, mm -hmm. The paper is called, uh, let me find it here. Um, it's a Korean group. And they're looking at effects of architectural elements on human relaxation arousal responses based on virtual reality and EEG. So That's they, super interesting. Yeah, I can send it to you if you'd like. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, and they what they did was to determine um, the size of a window, the the best size of a window um, on a wall for getting the maximum relaxation response from a person using virtual reality. And they, oh, they measured that in virtual reality. So they uh -huh. create a, a simulation where they ask people to react to different sizes of a window. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, actually I, I'm i moving into um, looking at uh, the use of immersive technologies in psychiatric practice because increasingly those types of technologies are picked up uh, by a psychiatrist and psychologists. Um, and there's this one really interesting project where patients diagnosed with schizophrenia together with psychiatrists and tech developers produce avatars that mimic the voices that they hear so they can confront, confront them in the virtual space. And I think it's really interesting how the simulation is sort of picked up as an epistemic object that they wanna think about in relation to evidence-based design. And here, sort of the knowledge practices of both psychiatrists, but also the experiences of the patient and the sort of capabilities of the, of the tech person have to sort of merge in the development of this um, uh, treatment practice. Right. Um, right. Anyway, I, I'm mindful of time here as well. Yeah, in fact, we've, oh my God, we've run way over yeah. what you allotted me. Yeah. So we better we better wrap it up. So I thank you for for the extra minutes. That that uh, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure, and uh, I'll send you the link so you can download it or watch it or anything you want to do. Uh, thank you very much, Louis. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, and and put me on your mailing list to get more copies of papers you write. So. Will do. All right. Thank you very much, Louis.